All right, thank you. Um, looking out in the audience like yesterday, there's a lot of people here that uh, I'm kind of humbled to be up here, but uh, I'm so glad to see everybody. And um, I, if you have any clarifying questions, feel free to ask, but uh, I guess we'll try to get through this. Um, first of all, uh, how many people here are organic farmers? Okay, and, and how about thinking about being organic? Okay, and in transition? Okay, so most of us are organic farmers here. That's good to see. Um, just a little background information. Uh, I'm from Jefferson, Iowa. Uh, our family farm has, you know, been in our in my family since uh, 1867. I think it was uh, right, at least one or two of the farms um, that long. And uh, so I've been real fortunate to, you know, have a land base to work with. Um, we've got about 1,800 acres. Um, we started to convert to organic in 1998. Um, and down at the bottom it says I have an engineering background. I actually went to uh, college and got a construction engineering degree, moved away from the farm for about 14 years, and um, some health reasons of my dad, uh, I came back to farm. And it's kind of put, I think it's helped me with going organic because I, I wasn't entrenched into the conventional uh, chemical farming way of doing things. In fact, it seemed like we were having more trouble getting chemicals to work. Um, for one reason or another. And so we had a chance to uh, transition 40 acres um, into organic in 1998. That, I say transition, it didn't have to go into transition. It didn't have any prohibited substances for three years. So uh, we tried the organic and, and then we, we slowly, um, you know, it took us 10 years before we had all of our acres organic. Um, and, I mean, there's times I wish, you know, I, I think financially, if you could just do it and you're just better off, but there's a learning curve to it. And, uh, you know, so I think it might have been a disaster if we'd have tried to do it much faster than that. Um, let me grab here. Okay. Um, to give you an idea maybe of what it, what it takes for us anyway to farm uh, 1,800 acres, um, you know, I, I myself, I'm full time on the farm. I have two uh, full-time employees, um, and one thing I'll say about employees, and I've got two, two really good guys, um, I mean, they're good farmers, they're good with equipment, and you want something like that, but probably most importantly, um, they, they, they buy into the organic uh, aspect of this 100%, and, and I think that's real critical. Um, we also have a, a guy that'll be with us, we'll need one full-time guy from you know, planting to harvest. Um, and equipment wise, I mean, I can just kind of look at this, and maybe it's the engineer in me again. Um, you know, we've, it seems like it takes us four row crop tractors. That during our busy season, we'll have all four of these tractors out in the field working with 16 row equipment. So I kind of break it down. I got, oh, it's four people, four tractors. So it, it averages out to be about 450 acres per person. And I think almost no matter what size your farm is, I, I'm guessing that maybe, you know, that's, that's a, an average for a lot of people. Goodness. Flipping here. Um, raising high yield, high yielding organic corn is, is the topic today. And this slide doesn't have a whole lot of substance to it, but I do think it's, it's real important that you know, you plan, I mean, especially this winter time, uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into this. Um, and then executing the plan. And probably the third thing is just at any time that you're trying to pay attention to all the details, um, whether it be, um, you know, your, your, your fertilizing plan, your weed control, um, just everything in the plan. The planning phase of it, uh, I think one of the most important parts is, it, from an organic standpoint, I mean, is the rotation. Um, we plant corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, and then a small grain. Um, I'm 
and I, and I guess I'll also say that, I mean, I say that's what we do, but I think I'm always thinking about if there's better ways to do things. And um, I, I honestly think, and I know Darren has a, a, a corn, soybean, small grain, and that I think is probably a better rotation. Um, we just, for all the reasons that people don't do small grains, um, I don't want that, you know, a third of our acres into small grains is, has been what's held me back, but I, I'm rethinking that all the time. Um, we're also planning our inputs, um, you know, getting things ordered, um, getting our seed, uh, selecting seed. Um, I'm, I'm looking, we, we'll get into fertilization later, but uh, uh, whether it would be a starter, foliar feeds, those kind of things, um, wintertime's a great time to be planning on that. Um, Equipment planning is, is real important. One thing we're going to try new is um, doing the roller crimper with, you know, the rye and just with soybeans and, and, and then some of this other equipment that I'll be showing you later on just for weed control. But uh, you need to have it ordered probably, you know, almost before the, the new year starts if you're going to use it the next spring. Uh, some of this equipment isn't, you know, just right off the shelf. Um, Executing, um, I guess it's keeping that plan in mind, follow the plan, um, but then also being ready and flexible to change the plan because, you know, Mother Nature steps in and, and usually, you know, you've got to modify one thing or another along the way. Um, or if it's, uh, you know, you think you sort of designed a piece of equipment that you thought was going to work real well um, and you get it out in the field and, and, you know, something isn't working about it just right, though, You've got to make changes uh, on the fly sometimes, too. Um, I kind of, I just went through, uh, that was what I just talked about. <laughs> I forgot my button. One thing I do, and this, I don't know if this is easy to read or not, but, and the substance of this isn't important, but it just, it, it just goes to show that, you know, yeah, that I, we, I do spend quite a bit of time on this actually, and it's kind of a, I mean, the first column is our, our fields, and we've got 19 different fields. Um, and then there's sort of five sections of that broke up at the top into five different years. I keep the middle year, and you can see the 2017 up there pretty good. Um, that's the year that we're going to. So I, I keep it, so the two years before, uh, it's a look back to know, so if I'm trying to decide what I'm doing, Next year, it helps maybe to know what we did in previous years. Um, and then the next two years are what are kind of is our planned rotation. Um, and, and then I also have a column in there for cover crops because I think it's important to keep track of what you're doing with your cover crops. Um, again, I, uh, what that says exactly isn't important, but it, it's the fact that you're thinking about that all the time. Um, one thing I'm and since I'm trying to get into the organic no-till, and, and I say it's a, you know, I call it a five-year rotation, it's really a two-year rotation and a three-year rotation, but I'm also looking at uh, maybe the, the first year of the five-year corn, um, I'll, I'll break it down into whether we want to plant a long season corn or a short season, and whether the timing of that planting, because what we do this year, then affects you know, what we want to try to do for a cover crop or what we want to try to do with our no-till beans. So, um, you know, I, it just, I, I think it's fairly complex, and so to put it down on paper just, just really helps me do that, figure that out. Can I ask you a question there? Yeah, go ahead. So, I stayed at West Farm. Mm -hmm. Expectation for like yield? For, for yield or the weed control or how something. Do you modify that if your expectation wasn't met so that your rotation might change based on what actually happened? I, I, I really don't. Um, and, 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 and maybe I'm too rigid. Again, it's the, the, the engineer in me and my wife just, you know, if I had to build a house, it would be square and it'd be like this. And so I'm kind of, I'm probably maybe more rigid or. Uh, systems oriented than maybe I should be, but 
because I'm also trying to even out maybe how much corn, how much beans. So I don't ch try to change. I, you know, if I do change, then I, all of a sudden I'm planting. I got 900 acres of corn and 400 acres of beans. You know, one year and then vice versa the next year. So I try to keep it fairly even um, on that. I, I don't know. I, I almost thought you thought those numbers up there are just acres. They're not uh, yield expectations or anything on that. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the key things is, is sweating the details. Um, and, and one thing, you know, we go to these conferences and, and since we're talking you know, organic, I'll try to focus on the things that make organic different. But I do think it's real important to keep in mind so many of the things we do are the same as conventional. I mean, we plant the corn, um, but, and as much, and, and so I, you know, still try to learn how conventional people raise good corn and but keep in mind that everything that they do if we can you know they're looking at trying to you know gain two three bushel here and there if we can gain two or three bushels it's worth two times as much so I've got you know it's it's sweating the details in, in the same way that the conventional farmers do times two um, and and that just comes into seedbed preparation uh, planting depth population plant spacing I mean, these are all things that, uh, and, the, and the, the technology and the equipment is out there that conventional farmers are using to improve all these things. Um, for instance, our, our planter, um, I mean, I think the planter is probably one of the most important things, you know, that you can have, not just equipped well, but also maintained well. Um, you know, have the right size disc openers on it, replace them when they get wore out, uh, that type of thing. But, um, we've kind of bought into the precision planning, so we've got, uh, you know, precision planning meters. Um, we've got the hydraulic downforce, which I really think uh, is nice to um, give us an even uh, seed depth all the time and, um, and then also not have too much down pressure. Um, we've got liquid starter on our planter and, um, you know, so I think taking this, the, the concept of conventional farming that we think works for conventional farmers when they can apply to organic is, is something we should do. Um, hybrid selection is real important. Um, now, given, I mean, hybrid selection, I mean, com obviously we're not selecting the same hybrids that uh, conventional farmers do, but uh, it's the same concept. There's some organic corn varieties, I think, are better than others. Um, disease recognition and control. Is, is certainly different in our world. Um, I think whether it be disease or even insects, sometimes when we do find it, it's almost too late because the products that we can use, um, they're not as immediate as, as the products that you can use in conventional farming. I mean, you can find something spray and it's dead, you know, in conventional farming. Our products are probably more, a little more systemic. Um, they almost need to be there ahead of time, but um, you know, that's certainly something we think about. Um, another detail is, you know, just having good harvest equipment. Um, I mean, there's no sense in leaving two or three bushels out in the field, especially when it's worth what we're getting for it. Um, some of the other organic considerations, um, I have timing and timeliness is critical. I think it's, it's much more critical in organics, and, and I'll say, it sounds like the same thing, but um, what I'll say, timing-wise, um, you know, when, when it's time to do it, you know, you, you do it. And I think there's three things um, that, you, that you look at. Um, like when we're deciding when to plant, say plant corn, um, the, the planting date, but yet you can't just look at the date. You also have to look at the weather that you're having now and your weather forecast. Um, honestly, I think last year, uh, and we planted probably earlier than we, we planted some corn on the 25th of April, even though we, but it was so nice around the 15th that I felt like, gosh, we just gotta get something in, and then it turned off cold. I think we would have been better off planting on the 15th of April. We had two weeks of warm weather, and then it turned cold. Um, you know, our best corn was planted around the May 7th, um, and that's, typical a lot of times and, and probably is a pretty good date to key off a of starting. 
Um, but again, I think you've got to look at the weather. Um, another thing we look at, if you have, I mean, say it looks good, we aren't necessarily going to throw all 700 acres of our corn in, in in four days, which we probably could do if we really, you know, had that window. But one thing we keep in mind is if we put it all in on the same day, it all needs to be hoed the same day, it, you know. It, it all needs to be, you know, it's all in the same stage then throughout the whole year. And then also, you never know for sure. I mean, you never know that Mother Nature's gonna, I mean, you, you, yeah, you look at the forecast, but um, if you put all your eggs in one basket, plant it all at one time, and maybe, you know, that was, if it turns out to be the wrong time, then that was the wrong decision. I guess you can be all right or all wrong in that case, but anyway. Um, I think it was talked about yesterday, the planting and replanting uh, versus replanting. I'll just reiterate what Paul said. I don't think I've ever replanted and regretted it, and I've had times when I feel like I should have replanted and didn't um, and, and regretted that. So, you know, the sooner you can recognize those things and, and, uh, and make that decision, the better. Um, you know, the weed control is certainly the big thing in, in organics, and, and uh, I'll kind of move on and we'll, we'll talk, I'm going to talk about mechanical weed control. Um, you know, I think there's some, uh, a lot of other things that we do, you know, rotations and uh, planting later um, that, that help, but uh, I'm going to get into the mechanical weed control. Um, when we plant, uh, I guess our philosophy is that, you know, we're doing whatever we need to do in that field to make sure that there's no weeds when we plant. I mean, and we generally we run a soil finisher, I guess, if, if the conditions are right and, and, you know, that's what we like to run ahead of our planter and we'll generally try to do that the same day that we plant. Um, depending on how wet things are, there's, you know, if they're dry, we're right behind the soil finisher with the planter. If, if, if it's a little wet, then we might have to wait half a day before we plant, but um, that's what we're going to do. Um, you know, again, ma equipment maintenance, and, you know, having good equipment and, and maintaining that equipment's critical. Um, you know, you keep your sweeps, uh, you know, not wore out. I don't know how to say that. Um, and properly spaced, it's just amazing how it, it'll be, we'll you maybe use that piece of equipment for a couple of years and then all of a sudden we look and, and you know, the sweeps are supposed to be at nine inches on center and you get looking and one of them moved on you, um, you know, just got loose and moved on you. So look for those things. Um, we, uh, uh, we run 12 inch sweeps uh, on our uh, soil finisher and they're at nine inches on center and you'd think, boy, that's a, you know, I think that's an inch and a half overlap on each end of the sweep, but it's amazing, especially if you're doing anything on a contour or, or, or something, or, or, you know, if you're getting square and you're that, you know, those weeds can slip between those two. So, I don't know, I wouldn't recommend anything less than that. Um, I have on here that we wipe the ends. Um, some of our, you know, we have buffer strips or, you know, where we can pull out into the, out of the field and turn around and come back in, but uh, you know, when you raise that cultivator, it may look like you, that front gang kind of hit everything right at the edge of the field, but you know you raise that cultivator at uh, the rest of the field and, or, you know, behind, and so you really didn't get a good job of killing the weeds, and you won't see it that day, but you'll see it, you know, a couple weeks from then. So we generally, you know, always wipe the ends with the, with the equipment. Um, one thing on, on our planter that we think makes a difference uh, in weed control is our closing wheels. Um, we run a, a Schlegel closing wheel, and I maybe should have had a picture of it, but um, it's kind of a, it's not a spike tooth, but it's, 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 a, it's about a half inch wire that is on a wheel, and it, it just, but it, it um, you know, it, it It'll, because our ground is generally pretty loose because we've, we've tilled it, it's, it's going into the ground. I've never seen where it seems to affect the weed, but it's, it's leaving it real loose and fluffy behind the planter um, as opposed to a, you know, probably the worst press wheel might be a, to me, a, a cyclo planter with a 
just the press wheel behind it where it's creating almost a, a perfect condition for grass to germinate um, and, and that. Um, okay, these are the things that we do after planting. Um, after we plant, we, you know, I think the early weed control is, is the most critical. Um, if you, you know, the most important thing is to let that corn get out ahead of your weeds. Um, so we try to, and, and this is, I'm going to say we probably don't even get to do it 50% of the time, but if we can, we try to blind harrow. And I say well, the reasons we can't generally are weather, um, but, uh, but we'll do that either with a tine weeder, we have an Einbach tine weeder or a rotary hoe. Um, we'll generally then, you know, let the crop come up. Uh, and, and we, we don't do all of these things, you know, on the same acres. Yeah, she, she's asking when we do our blind harrow, uh, when do we do it and why, I think is, is what you ask. Um, I mean, it's it's it, to me, it's all those things. I mean, she said, is it is it uh, um, growing degree days? Is it uh, is it just a certain amount of time? Is it it's it's those things. Um, but it's also you got to find you know if it rained and you can't get in the field, you can't do it then. But um, if it's cool, I mean, it could be seven you know five seven days after you plant. I mean, if, if provided you can still get in even then. Um, Obviously, you want to do it before your corn's spiking through. Um, I think you'd be surprised, though. I mean, that spike can be just under the surface, and you can still get, you can still do that work and, and not affect it. Um, but I think if it's spiking through, then then you better hold off. Um, I, I think it just, it, I'd say it's almost more the stage of the corn. I mean, if the corn is, is you know, you'd want to catch it maybe right before it spikes through because then once it starts to spike. And again, depending on the weather, but I mean, you're looking at probably not being able to do anything for, you know, three to seven days, depending on the weather and how fast it's growing. Um, and, and so then again, you, you know, after you do the blind harrow, then, then again, you're waiting for that corn to come up and, and, and get large enough to either rotary hoe or tine weed. And, and then again, that might depend on, you know, I, we can rotary hoe sooner than we can run through it again with the tine weeder. I mean, the tine weeder's, I think, a more effective tool on, on the grass and the weeds, but it's probably more effective on tearing out corn, too. So, um, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, I'll try to uh, maybe run through these, and then I'll get through some pictures. We have an Einbach rotation, which I'll just have to show you what it is. Um, it, 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 it's, it was Ein, Einbach's answer. The tine weeder can be somewhat of a dump rake. If you have a lot of residue, you know, I think that's the, probably the biggest complaint about it is that it drags a lot of residue. So this, the, the rotation was their answer to that. Um, it's, it's sort of like in a super aggressive rotary hoe. Um, but I've got some pictures and, and a video of, of that. Um, We've got a buffalo cultivator that, uh, the buffalo cultivator and the Glencoe cultivator are cultivators that we use uh, as early as we can. And, and they're set to be close to the row. Um, we've got the buffalo cultivator set up with uh, disc hillers that pull dirt away from the row and they're set real close to the row. So they're, they're if, if they're leaving the ridge, where, where that dirt is being pulled away from the row, that ridge is only about four or five inches wide. Um, the Glencoe is a pretty standard uh, three shank um, cultivator. We have tunnel shields on it, um, set the shovels close to the row and, and go with it. The international cultivator um, is a lot like the Glencoe. I mean, it's a three shank cultivator, but we just have it set up a little bit different so that it's kind of a mid-season tool. Um, we call our flamer a mid-season tool. 
Um, I know there's some guys that like to flame, and I've got some pictures of, well, that picture of that corn right there. Um, the corn row on the right is flamed, and the corn row on the left is not. That's probably about as early as we like to flame. Um, and because we've just found that we, when you flame that early or earlier, and you, you, you knock the grass back, but you knock the corn back, and it seems like by the time you can get around to doing something with the corn again, the grass is coming back. Um, if you've got broad leaves, um, I think the guys maybe that find success with that are just because they're trying to get their broad leaves, and, and it pretty well nails the broad leaves, and they won't come back. What growing stage would you say you start doing the flaming? That was like, it, it just that stage right there. That, that's, that was like the next day or two days after we flamed it. So, um, well, I forgot to put on, on, on here that we have a, a souk-up cultivator that we consider our lay-by cultivator. Uh, it's a single-sweep cultivator. It, we can, you know, move pretty fast with it and throw a lot of dirt, and we're trying to throw a lot of dirt into the row. Um, this is that, basically that same picture that you saw before, but um, just a little expanded view of it. Um, you can see that it really, really nailed the grass back, and, and there was no yield difference here, so I don't, you know, I don't think we really hurt the corn any, um, but... Uh, I think we it, it gained us something here. Um, where's Nick? There you go. This is our buffalo cultivator, and, and I mentioned the double disc killers, um, and I've got another picture that shows those pretty well. But we also put um, finger weeders on the bar um, that are then behind, and there's... Yeah, I think... So. Oh, no, that's not the one, but that's all right. But, but you just keep going. I mean, it's still, it's the same cultivator. Uh, those are the finger weeders. The finger weeders do a pretty good job of uh, getting into the row. They, this is soybeans, obviously. Um, seemed like I had more pictures of what we'd been doing in soybeans than corn. Um, you can see we took the, the shovels that would normally be in, the, in between the row. The, the one thing this shows, you can see that that one row has one of those rotation elements instead of the finger weeders. Um, and you can see that in this size of beans, it's probably too aggressive. Um, it was something we were trying out. And, uh, you know, later on, it, it's amazing how much abuse these crops can take, but I don't think we could tell later on in the season, you know, where that went. But it, it sure, we quit doing it after a couple of rounds. <laughs> You can look up ahead here. You can see where it was pretty grassy, and then you can see it's pretty clean behind. These videos are a little longer than I thought they were. <laughs> I'm standing up here. Those, I believe, they were sixteen hundred dollars a row. Yes, yeah, yeah. And as bad as those soybeans looked in that row as that one rotation was, probably a day, day and a half later, you couldn't tell. Yeah. You couldn't tell the difference between them. How about the weed control? The weed control, I don't, I don't know that we could tell the difference in the weed control from that versus the fingers either. I don't know. The, it looks like it's doing a better job. Um, but uh, sometimes you just don't know. Okay, let me. How much did you say that cost? <coughs> they were they were sixteen hundred a row, I believe. This picture um, on the left, you can see it's not as weedy as on the right, and that was we were running. And I'll get to the uh, picture of this rotation, um, but we had run that rotation element, uh, not on the back of the buffalo, but it's it, a whole complete unit. Um, and then that's just a blow up of the, of the finger weeders on, on the other unit. They, uh, you can see the, it, it, I mean, you have the, the, the yellow fingers are, are plastic or rubber. They're, they're fairly stiff. 
the one thing I don't like, they do get a memory where they, you can see they're kind of sticking up. They should be flat. Uh, actually, what happens is, you know, as you go, they get bent up, and then there's a, a disc that's kind of behind it, and dirt gets between the plastic and the disc, and then it just kind of holds them up. So I think a couple times during the year we took them off and cleaned them, and, and then they go back flat, or you, you, you kind of flip them over and just run them the other direction, and, you know, that works pretty good. The... The steel fingers down below are really what drives it. Um, those, those are hitting the ground, and, and then that's what causes the rotation of those fingers. Um, this is our flamer. Um, the, uh, the picture on the left, I'm st we're standing behind it. Um, those, the, the row would be, this would be where the row is. And uh, so those shields are like side shields that would keep the wind from, from uh, and, and it would help hold in the heat and the flame. Um, we also have covers that we can put over the top of that if we do want to flame small corn. Um, but again, typically, I said, we, we typically don't. Um, the burners are, are there and there. There's one on each side of the row, and it, uh, it blows the flame alongside the corn uh, towards the opposite direction that you're driving. Um, this, the, the picture on the right is, is a picture looking at the uh, flamer from the front. Um, you got, and it's just a cultivator frame. Those gauge wheels are cultivator gauge wheels. There's the burners again, um, you know, blowing the flame, say, away from that picture. Here's another video. Um, this is the, the Einbach rotation. Um, you can see we're in a little taller beans here. Um, I know that it might be hard to see. We, we just got, we didn't even tried it on corn. And I've had some people tell me it may not work on corn. Um, we just got it last year about, I mean, we wanted it earlier in the spring. And I, I mean, I ordered this in, I'm getting to the timing, I think November or December a year ago. And it didn't come till like about the first of June or something like that. So we just got to use it in, in the beans. No, but go ahead and play it. It's there. This I'll just jump to that. Um, this is our buffalo cultivator. Little no different one. No, that's the same one we did. Go ahead and skip that. There you go. Yeah, I really do think the rotation was was real helpful. Um, later on, you can kind of like tip the camera or the telephone, <laughs> the camera up. You can see ahead of this rotation that it's it's pretty green. This field stayed fairly clean all year too. I mean that's. It's always hard to tell, you know, one one day or as soon as you go through something, just how good a job you did. But I think sometimes you can tell later in the year when, you know, this field stayed pretty clean and and other ones didn't. They're going to shoot it against the head of the that, no, that's the only thing that's doing anything uh, is those rotations. Like I said, it's kind of a, I mean, it's a rotary hoe, but obviously the wheels are, are cocked a little sideways. So, you know, they... and. And it's a real stiff wire. I mean, yeah, you can't, it has no flexibility at all. Um, this, uh, this was corn the previous year. Um, and then we, we planted barley in the spring. And uh, I mean, this is a little longer story, but we, we take barley and wheat and we'll cut it when it's this high and dry it and pelletize it. And it it goes to another company that makes uh, human health food out of it. So we're looking for acres to do some of that stuff on. So we sort of like a cover crop. Um, we had planted barley in the spring and, and cut it and then tilled it under. And you know, by the time we do all that, the corn stalks are just gone. Yeah. No, no, we didn't moldboard. It's all disked, a, a pretty aggressive disk. Yeah, it's for, for, for I'll call a primary tillage. I mean, then we soil finished it. 
Um, Oh, it, it, it likes it a lot more than the tine weeder. Yeah. Um, I mean, it'll pretty much roll the residue. I mean, it'll push it over and, and move through it. It won't gather it up and bunch it up like, um, I mean, if you have corn, corn butts, and you can even see in this video, there was some, some little clods that were getting caught between the wheels. Um, it, you might think that, you know, like a rotary hole, catch something and then drag along a wheel and, you know, so you got to watch it just like a rotary hole, but I don't think it probably caught up any more than the rotary hole did on, you know, as far as having to get off and, and clean something out of it. Um, this is something that we do and it's a little hard to read, but part of our organic requirement is that we keep track of everything we do in the field and and this is how I do it. Uh, Farm Logs is a, an app you can get on your phone and, and it's, it's free for what we use it for. It's capable of doing more and, and you, can, you can pay some money to have them take aerial photographs and do things like that. But um, basically you can input you know, all your equipment, your tractors and so um, this is the West, it, and, and it, when, it, when you print it out, you don't have an option, it does it in reverse order. So starting at the bottom, um, you know, we planted on May 7th, um, this is our sunflower, and it, because we did both of these on the same day, it just didn't get them in the right reverse order. Um, but, you know, we soil finished it, we planted it, and, and this is what was kind of, what I thought was, you know, I'll stand up here and tell you, oh yeah, we always blind harrow, and we do that four days after we plant. And I got looking at all of our fields, and I was amazed at how many times and uh, that we didn't do anything for 10 days after we planted. And I really got to figure out if it was weather or cold. I mean, we just, maybe the crop wasn't coming up as fast as we thought it would, but um, again, you can see May 7th, we planted. May 16th, we hoed it. We ran the buffalo. I think is that June 4th? It's hard to read. June 10th. Um, we ran that Glencoe cultivator. Um, we uh, foliar fed it on uh, the 17th. And then it just takes off because even this Glencoe is, this corn probably was, I don't know, like in a V3 or 4 maybe. Um, and the International, it's pretty tall. And, and, you know, so from June 10th to June. 21st, 11 days, we're laying it by. And you know, it's almost waist high at that point. So um, that just gives you an idea of you know what we did on that one particular farm, but that was fairly typical this year anyway. Um, from a fertility standpoint, um, uh, we do soil testing. We, we do it on every farm. Uh, every four years at least, but it's generally every four years. And part of the reason for that is that uh, for manure management plans, that is a minimum of requirement to do it every four years. I mean, I'd like to do it more. It'd be interesting to see it, but it, you know, it gets pretty pricey to do a whole lot more than that. Uh, we do grid sampling or management zones. It depends on the farm. Once, once we kind of did, I mean, one year we did all grid, when we kind of moved to grid sampling, we did that, and then a couple years later on different farms we did uh, management zones, and, and we've just stuck with doing the same thing on each farm after that, just so that we have some consistency and we can try to see some trends in our soil tests um, moving forward. Um, probably the first thing I look at is, is the pH, um, just to see, because I, We'll lime, uh, if, if we need to anywhere, we'll lime first. We've really found, though, that I don't think I've limed anything for probably seven or eight years, that I think being organic, not using anhydrous, not using chemical chemicals and stuff, where our pH is just, are, they're going up, if, if anything, and not going down. Um, we... Uh, we use gypsum on our high mag areas, um, and the gypsum gives us our the uh, 
a lot of calcium and, and uh, sulfur. Um, and we, we've averaged about 1,400 pounds per acre, and that'll run us about $40 an acre uh, applied and hauled in and everything. Um, we've also variable rated it based off of the mag uh, results of our soil tests to where we'll start at 500 pounds and go up like 250 pounds. As, and, I, and I'm not, I, don't quote me, we're starting out at about 15% uh, on the magnesium and then if it goes up a percent, we're adding 250 pounds, um, something like that, I can't remember for sure, but um, let's see. Um, Yes and no. I mean, we we did some. I mean, we did it regularly for two or three years, then skipped five or six. I, I mean, I'm not sure we can. You know, it, it's not like a we have, and, and then we don't necessarily have test strips either. But um, we started doing it and do it almost, and we do it more before our beans. Um, but we feel that it it helps um, decrease the amount of foxtail pressure we have. I mean, it loosens us. It, Whatever the calcium's doing in the soil is keeping that foxtail from taking off on us. And we've, it's like anything, you, you think you see that one year and you think, man, this really worked great. And then the next year, you, or this particular field has a foxtail issue and you're kind of going, well, why, you know, we put down the gypsum, but still had it. Um, Yeah, a, a little bit, but um, as much as that sounds, it's, it, and so we're not doing it every year on every field. Like I said, it's maybe before the bean year, so it's two out of five years. Um, I think to maintain it, yeah, we're, we're continuing to do it. We're, oh, I need it. We're, yeah, I think we're about, so we have time for Darren to. Oh, okay, okay. I, let me just go real quick our primary you know I just think animal manures we're getting the most bang for our buck um, all the way around um, and I really like the starter we've been doing that for a long time we just started doing some foliar sprays and last year um, I'm not 100% sold on those two years ago we had some real issues with disease and we had a wet June and then last year we had a dry June and so I don't think we saw much benefit out of the foliars um, in, in that regard. And I mean, it's, it, it's a combination fertilization and we also put some uh, biological uh, fungicides in it that we thought would help with disease. But anyway, let me give Darren a chance. I didn't realize I had so much in common with Scott. The things that I found out is I didn't, I'm an engineer. I guess he's an engineer. We both started in 1998, and probably the real secret, which I didn't realize, we drive yellow tractors and yellow combines. <laughs> I think that must be the solution. But I uh, um, appreciate the opportunity to come and just share um, some of our experiences. I certainly don't have the answers, and I feel like in many ways I was asked to share my experiences. Um, I'll give you my experiences. Um, they're just seeds. Um, that's kind of fitting, I guess, a little bit to our farm name, Scatter Seeds. I'm just going to scatter some seeds, and you think about them and decide if they work for you or don't work for you. So this is my family. My son, Travis, is here with me today. He's a, my second son. He's in Iowa State. I have an older son that just graduated from Iowa State. I have two other boys and a daughter. Um, we run about 1,350 acres in northwest Iowa. Our ground's pretty square, pretty flat, and so in some cases we have some advantages over some of you. Our primary crops are corn. Uh, we've gotten a little bit more into edible beans um, and to oats, and we've worked a rotation. It's not a perfect rotation. It continues to evolve, as most of you know, and so I can't sit here and and tell you for sure what is the right rotation, but we'll kind of get into it a little bit more. So growing high yield organic corn, and, and one of the thoughts I had is, what's high yield? What, do you, what are you looking for? What, as organic farmers, what, 
that you want to share? What is high yield fuel? And I do realize that everybody's given different resources and different soil types, and you're in different parts of the country. But anybody want to share? What, what are you looking for? Okay, competitively with conventional. So what would that be for you? Yeah, 150 to 200. Okay, so we're going for quality. Anybody growing food grade corn right now? Okay, there's a few of you. And that's what we do. Everything we grew in 2016 was all food grade, both corn and all our edibles and our oats and all that we grew for food grain. And I believe, I'll, I'll say it this way, um, Iron is not the solution to any of that, in my opinion. That's my experience. Um, in fact, I'll, we'll get into that a little bit. There's a lot of other things that I think are very key to make those things happen. So this is just a picture from this fall. I was out pulling some ear, or uh, just walking through a field, and I snapped a picture, didn't know I was going to be talking, but that's a picture of just a field. And you can see clear in the upper corner over there, I got a little bit of grass, but nothing that's really impacting my yield. Um, and so it's a system. It's no silver bullet. There is no one answer. And I think most of you as organic farmers already know that. To those of you that are transitioning and looking, I can't give you a one answer. But there's a series of things that I think we have done that have been able to get us to, to really good yields. And I asked the PFI people if I should share my yields. Um, I will. It's not because I feel like I'm any better than anybody else. Um, we did have really, really good yields the last few years. And I think it's, there's a couple factors. But, you know, you have to get to a, a place. Oops. Um, you know, that's, that's cultivating corn. Dark, deep, green corn shows a lot of good fertility. Even emergence, even spacing. Well, spacing isn't as critical to me, probably, as, as some would say, but perfect emergence. When you're out in a field cultivating right like that, you know you have good potential. And it's, it should be really, really good corn. And it turns into something like this, healthy-looking corn. Um, it comes from, in my opinion, a great fertility program and a lot of other factors which we'll, we'll kind of stumble into. So real quick, um, I, I threw together, just picked a farm, threw some slides out. Um, red is 140 below. Green is going to be anything over 200. So I just took a farm. This was in 2010. Planted it. You can see I, I didn't have it figured out. We're still working at some things. I had a lot of sub, this is a yield map, fairly calibrated. I can't say it's exact. Um, and the slides are going a little bit different here. Um, let's see what did I do wrong there. That's the pointer. Is there a way it can just advance? Let me. Well, it's it's yield map. It's just a yield map here. It's yield in a certain area of the field. There should be another picture pull right up next to it. So I'm sorry. 140, 140, 160, 180, 200. Just in this particular case. So. Oops, can you back it up a little bit? Okay, I'm missing, missing part of the slides here. So 2010, 2012, I was starting to see some green. I'm thinking, well, we're making some progress. We're figuring some things out. Um, 2014, 2012 had been a dry year. 2014 was a wet year. We have a hybrid issue on the one side of the field. I had some ragweeds in the corner. I'm getting some green. I'm getting some 200 bushel corn. I'm thinking, we're getting closer. And so we kept continuing to make some changes, and this was 2016. Again, I don't have the right picture here, but... This is what it ended up being. Most of those green was all over 240 bushel corn. Um, the yellow is over 220. Very, very, very little of any. There's only reds on that farm. I thought I showed you the other picture was just the endros. And so it can work. And that's the exciting part about organic farming and growing good corn is that when you get things to kind of come together, um, you can grow really good corn. We can do, I believe, I think 250 is possible in our world. I think it is. There's no reason to believe that we can't compete on a conventional level. The genetics are the same. It's just a matter of getting the system to support it. So anyway, so number one factor that influences yield, what is it? Weather. Weather. Outside our control, right? Oops. Um, this thing is not going to work the way I want it to. That's too bad. Can we just pull up the deck? Can we just pull up the, uh, that's fine, just leave it like that. Okay, I'll just, I'll scroll through this like this. So these are supposed to come in order and that's okay. I believe, yeah, obviously weather's number one. So then I had to stop and think about as I look back on my years as an organic farmer, what were the other factors that I feel are most, uh, most influencing of corn yield? And in my situation, again, I'm in Northwest Iowa, it's a little flatter. 
The number one issue, issue is drainage, then soil fertility, then weed control, then the genetics that I'm using, then my planting pr process, and then um, tillage and cultivation. So we're a little short on time, so I'm not going to try to go through all of this, but um, let me come back here again. So obviously with drainage, one of the things I believe we have to do is get good roots. So we need to get oxygen into the soil. We need to, you know, if we got good drainage, we have less compaction. One of the things we know in organics is we need to be out there. Scott spoke of timeliness and getting in the field when we need to. Um, if we've got wet spots in our field, it's just not going to work. It's different than the conventional guys that have the opportunity to spray, get over the field, put a residual type herbicide on there, and it can hold those weeds back. We need to be um, in that field when we need to. And so from my experience, if you have a farm that's poorly drained, you almost got to start there. Now, I realize there's costs and sometimes there's rented farms. We've gone to put in tile in rented farms just because it's the right thing to do. It pays for itself. Um, and then, then also it gives us less weeds. So anybody contest that? Anybody feel differently? Are there any guys doing a lot of drainage work or do you need to? Okay, there are some. Um, I would really encourage you to think about that. If you're going to try to raise the bar from 140, 150 bushel corn to 200 bushel corn, um, you're going to have to start with a good foundation, which is, you know, a farm that has the ability to drain. So for me, that's been my number one uh, factor. I'm just going to show you real quick. This is a field that was planted in 2013. This was the yield map, and we can talk about yield data. Most of you probably have yield monitors. It's a great place to start if you're going to try to manage um, zones in your field. You need to start with the yield map. And you can see I've got some problem issues here. Um, I knew where I had some tile was right there. That was tile that we had put in. We decided the next summer when we had oats planted, we went in there and planted, uh, or not planted, but, but did a bunch of tile work. And this is what the yield map looked like the following year. This is in 2015. You can't see that real well, I'm sorry, because it's not uh, blown up. But this is probably my best field. This, this area where I had shown those pictures right away, this end of the field was doing over 240 organic corn. Um, look beautiful. It can be done. And so when things come together, um, you can grow high yield corn. So the number two thing was fertility. Um, I'm showing a couple pictures here. We use chicken litter. Um, I generally do three ton in the fall um, ahead of corn. I like to side dress, and the reason I like to side dress is primarily from a risk management stand standpoint. I've seen too many of my crops over the years in 2010 and prior that we run out of gas late in the season. And um, for me to be able, you could put all that manure on, but it seems like if you get too much snow on it in the, as it melts in the spring, as I got too much rain in the spring, we got the crop out of the ground, we got it up to a certain stage, and then we would just start to run out of gas. And the yields would just kind of hang there. We need to finish strong. And um, I went to this, um, I don't know if you can see that. I wish I could pull that up a little bit better. But this is right after uh, second, this is right after first cultivation. I'm going to go back to playing this here. I think maybe this will work. Um, we're, I'm doing my second cultivation here right now. Um, we're putting about three quarters of a ton of turkey compost or chicken manure as a top dress on top of this corn crop. Um, we did stock nitrate tests in the end of the year. We were, we were really good. We, we held it all the way to the season, and that's why that farm did, on a whole average, well over 200, 200 225, 230, I think. So what we're doing um, is trying to feed a healthy soil to get it to be there to produce. And we, we you know, tend to not focus. We don't do a lot of variable rate. Um, we would with lime. Uh, we don't put a lot of lime on because we're using mostly uh, uh, chicken manure that's high in calcium, and we have high calcium soils anyway. Um, but we've, we've, I've found this to be a solution that we've implemented in the last two years that's really taken our yields to another level, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yes, Roger? Um, so you said uh, three quarters of a ton for the acre? This is on the top dress right here. Now, sir, are you concerned about it's kind of a bad time of year to put a manure product out there because you're going to lose a lot of your nitrogen? How did you come up with that three quarters? So I'm an engineer, but I'm not a research scientist like Joel here. So there's more tests that I should, should do. To be honest, they're very simple. One time down around the field and back, and it's empty. 
three quarters of a ton. So. So the question is, am I, am I worried that I'm losing a lot of nitrogen? I believe what I'm doing is putting a new um, opportunity for a lot of soil biology. And so I had, I had somebody tell me this. Um, this is from a seasoned uh, manure applicator. I asked him, how much manure do I lose uh, by leaving it lay on the ground? He says, I think you lose more manure from the spinners to the ground than you lose by leaving it on the ground. Now, you can all contest that. I don't know. But I think he's probably, tr there's some truth to that. Um, there's a lot of ammonia smell when we spray it, or spread it, excuse me. So it smells pretty good. And I think maybe I'm losing a lot. But what I'm doing right behind this is coming back and, and burying it. I'm burying it in. So I, I don't think I'm losing it a whole lot. But, but, but the nice part about it for me is I think it helps me finish strong. It's there if I need it. I don't know that I'm always going to need it. I did do some tests this year, uh, that year, and the side-by-sides didn't see a lot of difference. I was hoping to see more, but, you know, I think it was just a good year. Yeah, real quick. Three quarters after three cutting the fall? Yes. Are you cutting back in the fall? No, I'm still, I'm still pushing three in the fall. Yep, I am. So, yes? So, this, was, this would have been the second cultivation. Um, we'll do one more time. Yep. And you said that was slightly composted or straight? So it, I'm using layer manure, so it's, it depends. Some of that manure had sat around for a long time, so there's some compost. I, I still consider it manure. There is a restriction on this. Obviously, you can't put this on too close to harvest, but this is still early enough in the season. We're putting this on, oops, we were putting this on June 2nd, I think is what the, what this, what the timing was. So. We can come back to that. So drainage, number one, things that I can control. Number two, soil fertility. I can do everything else right, but if I don't have that there to start with, I don't think we're going to get high yield corn. Uh, we might still be able to get some good density. We might still be able to get some good quality. But if we're going to really push to try to compete with our conventional counterparts, I think that's what we need to do. So I have weed control. And OK, I'll keep going. I sh we should be good. Crop rotations are important. I think we know that. Um, as organic producers, we're going to have to you're going to have to be open-minded to breaking that weed species cycle. The you can't just go corn soy, corn soy. Um, I just I haven't found it to be successful, um, or even do too much of that row crop stuff. I mean, uh, when I do small grains, I prefer not to do an underseeding. I prefer just to to do it just as oats. I like to to tear up that soil. Afterwards, bury all the, the, the volunteer, the grass that's coming, reseed the volunteer oats. Um, I, I've, foxtail is not a concern for me in any of my fields. Um, can we see it? We'll see it in places, maybe on the end rows where there's some compaction. But as a rule, foxtail is not my, my problem weed. Giant ragweed is right close to that. And we have had some issues, but um, we had some terrible issues in some cases when I've messed up. But So crop rotations are important. Um, I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time about that. I, I don't have a, a magic silver bullet for it. Um, we do oats. We do green peas. Um, this year I planted some buckwheat and sun hemp after my peas, trying to learn from that as well. So I, I really want to be able to make that work. But um, uh, crop rotation is and cover crops are important for weed control. Um, just a little bit on planting, I guess, again, just to kind of kind of reiterate some of the things that Scott said. Patience is really, really huge. Um, it's really hard not to plant when everybody else is planting. Uh, my, my rule of thumb is never ahead of a rainstorm. That's my thing. If it's going to rain, you just as well leave. Don't even think about it. Because to me, if, if I were to give, and I know uh, those of you in the meeting last week, or right before this, he said, don't give out any secrets. Well, I should just shut up and go on. But to me, one of the things that you do is don't give any weeds an opportunity to grow. And it's a race for that corn to get out of the ground. So my, my theory is, is keep that top dry. And Scott was alluding to that a little bit too. Don't pack, don't let any water, you know, environment to let weeds grow after you plant because they're going to come out of the ground before your corn does. And everybody knows it's a race to get it out of the ground. So patience is a big thing. I try to plant two inches deep. Um, I like a nice mellow seed bed. I think a great seed bed equates to great emergence. Uh, warm soils as opposed to just getting it in. Um, I've gambled. Um, I would say as a rule, it does not pay to go plant early. Sometimes it'll work because you get a prolonged dry spell and maybe a warm spell right behind it in late April, 
and it'll work. But if I had to roll the dice on it, I don't think it will. That's not my experience. So I'm usually targeting May 1st to May 15th. This year I planted May 5th to May 16th. And on May 16th, um, that those fields were yielding. That, well, they, again, I, please just, I'll just tell you for what they were. It did probably close to 220, 112-day corn planting on May 18th. And now, again, those are maybe strange risks, but, the, but it can work. And um, so I don't think it hurts to push our planting back a little bit. I think Scott alluded to that, too. Again, those are my experiences. It may not work well for you. We shoot for 30 to 35,000. I would say most of my stuff is 34.5. Um, we'll variable rate our seeding. Um, some cases, I'll push it to 36 in some really good zones. Um, I think that's enough. I've done some tests in the past where I pushed it up higher. I think you grow a lot of vegetation. I don't think you grow a lot of kernels or at least we don't have the fertility to support it. And now maybe with some changes in our fertility program, I can push them rates a little bit. I haven't done it yet. I think a good, you know, 32,000 final stand, nice, even, you know, consistent ear height corn, you can combine that and really be, really be happy with it. So the goal um, is uniform emergence. I will say on seed treatments and a little bit to some of the things Scott was saying, I've tried a lot of things I've done. in furrow fish, and I, this, I'm not gonna fault anybody's products. I think they have their place. In a good manure program, I've found that a lot of the biologicals just don't seem to add value to me. And so I'm not trying to knock them, but if you were to ask me, I don't do a lot of foliars. I've tried that, that's not worked. Um, now I've not tried foliars like boron and magnesium or some of these other micros. That part I have not messed with yet. I would like to, but I do do a mycorrhiza seed treatment. I have found that to be effective to me um, it's just, it's cheap. Uh, you can do an agri-energy MST, uh, micro seed treat. It's a little bit of mycorrhiza, a little biological. I just think it just seems to work for me, and I just continue to do that. So, um, yes? So, if I've done tests, I've done side-by-side. -side. And I would say, I've done some side-by-side -side tests where I can see 7 to 10 bushel better. I think I get a little better emergence in a, perf in a, in a perfect spring. You might not see any difference, but I think it gives me just a little bit of edge just to get that crop going, give it some protection to get it going. So for that, it, it, I think some people say, what do you do for, you know, extra amendments? It's the only one I do. So I'm not saying there aren't others out there that are, that are better. That could work, but I found that one to be one that works pretty consistent for me and that I continue to do. So um, just real quick, um, I plant full season corn. Okay. Let me, let me finish if I could, please. Um, I plant full season corn. My theory on that is, is our nitrogen is taking a long time to break down. And it's, it, you know, if I draw a chart, it's just going like this through the year. I want my, my crop to take advantage of every bit of nitrogen it can possibly get before we need to start drying down. Um, we do 105 to 112 day up in my area, so I'm north of you. If you're south of me, I'm not sure. If you're south of me, I would say I would encourage you to do 109 to 112. I think full season corn is better on my farms than short season corn. And I think that, you know, it's um, with a biological nitrogen component, it takes so long for it to break down. I would say it's continuing to break down. But I like to wait. Again, my experience. Um, real quick, and I, I put tillage practices clear at the end, um, partly because I believe that's where it belongs for me. I think I need all those other things in place before I spend too much time. I know as farmers we like to work with gadgets and, and toys, and I've tried a lot of different things, but this is what I use right now. Um, that's just a picture of my tractor and field cultivator. I put a rolling basket on the back. I like that. You see in these bottom two pictures um, a tine weeder. Um, I used to harrow with an old Melrose 
uh, type harrow. I didn't like that. And largely as a blind harrowing, and what I didn't like about that is that I can't keep the ground level. When it gets back to emergence, we don't want some seeds this deep because of a harrow trail and some this deep. I found too many times I felt like plants were giving me barren ears because they were a weed and not a corn. So I'm okay with, with the uh, tine weeder because if you could see up here in the corner, it's, it's pretty much leaving that perfectly flat. Um, and I think that's important for emergence. So we do use that. Um, this is just, I use a rotary hoe. Nothing fancy about my rotary hoe. I'll probably rotary hoe one to two times. Um, cultivate three times. And um, in terms of my other tillage practices, I did want to just share this with you. This is not the tractor that pulls this ripper. We're tearing up some, um, some manure areas. We had piled some manure. But in 2014, it was a wet year for us. 2013 was too. And I saw places where I had done some deep tillage and places that I hadn't, that when I combined that corn, I could see the yields run in 200 and then just drop. And I was so frustrated, I couldn't figure out what the deal, what was happening there. And I remembered that in some of those fields, I had dissed and had not deep tilled it, hadn't taken a deep ripper through it. And I th what I concluded is, is and, and I could almost make my yield maps, I want to say, I don't want to say totally correlate this because I'm not a scientist, where we don't have good root penetration to go down and get nutrients that they need. The roots seem to go out like this if they hit a compaction zone. And because of that, in organic, we can't force feed it from the top with more nutrients. It needs to go down and get deep. 2015 was the first year I started doing some deeper tillage. And I would do it right ahead of corn. Um, in some cases, I would spread my manure in the fall, and I'd come right back. I'd put one of my boys in the tractor and just let him go. Um, we'd, we would deep rip. It's a minimum dis uh, disturbance, so it's not really flailing the dirt over. It's just going down deep, lifts the soil, and in my opinion, the next spring, water goes away quicker, roots go deeper, uh, we see healthier corn, and I think we could probably even back some of our fertility that we're putting off. I think we could back some of that back just a little bit because we're getting good yields. And I don't, I, I offer that in the sense that I don't know that I have for sure. So. The research side of me should say I should take a piece of that field and not inline rip it. I've not done that because I'd like to go for my good yields. But that's a change that's taken place in the last few years that I think is really attributed to it. So um, that's, I like this picture. It's just kind of the goal. You know, it's, it's nice to be able, wife's in the combine, one of the boys is in the grain cart. You know, this is kind of the reward of, of things coming together and, and working out well. Combining really, really good corn. The crops are good. We're blessed. I, you know, I can't take credit myself because some of it is out of my control. But um, I do think it's a journey. It's a system. It's a lot of little pieces kind of placed together. And I offer them simply as seeds for you to think about. If it fits, try it. Um, I think it can work. Yes. As fast as I can pull it, you know, type of thing. Um, 14 inches is where we are with our tractor. I have a 765 MT, MT 765 tractor. We've run it about 14. Um, that seems to be getting underneath our hard pan, lifting it up. Seems to work work really really well. Takes out just whatever compaction is there. Yes. So typically, I would plant. I'm a little undecided this year because this is the first year I planted. I can go into either my edible beans, which like nitrogen. Or I might go into corn. I have I I've, I've set it up that I can do either right now. So, um, well, I'm saying I've got it in a place. If I need to put more manure on in the spring to go for corn, I will. Right now, I got two ton of manure on in the fall, and then all of this. If I got 100 units of N there from my sun hemp, I won't need any more, especially if I side dress corn. So, I'd like to probably do some testing this spring, see if we can't figure out what's there for, you know, what what a soil test would show me in terms of. Um, available fertility so that sun hemp came after I planted my peas so it would have been like the first part of July mid July is when I see the sun hemp got this tall I had it with buckwheat and sun hemp and it yeah sun hemp was this tall we just took a stock cutter um, we let it grow until I got that tall and then this fall um, I'm not sure what when it would have been I have to look back but we just took a stock cutter through it and shredded it 
it's laying on the ground. So, Joel? Yeah, I, that may have been a big mistake. I'm not sure because my buckwheat did go to seed. Um, if I go to edible beans, I think I've got till June something before I plant, and my hope is that I can clean a lot of that up. So um, one of those oopses I didn't think about. I didn't anticipate it going to seed. But Sure. It's a great point. I mean, it's pulling phosphorus. It's pulling nutrients up. It's, it's a... It's a cover crop, yeah, absolutely. You know, I can send you a picture <laughs> next spring. It may look like a disaster, but anyway, if anybody's got any questions afterwards, please just give me a call. Or, Thanks,